This series contains adult language and descriptions of graphic violence throughout. Listener discretion is advised. Cavalry Audio. By the end of 1989, most metropolitan police agencies, as well as thousands of smaller precincts, had amassed and distributed to its officers a simple guideline for identifying Satan worshippers. The document, usually less than a page long, had bullet points explaining what to look for if Satanism was suspected. One particular agency went a step further and produced a video entitled The Law Enforcement Guide to Satanic Cults, which, thanks to the internet, lives on as a much derided and campy attempt to tackle what was considered a very serious threat to the public safety. But it's what was mentioned in every police agency's one-page handout given to patrolmen, detectives, teachers, and parents that we'll be focusing on. It was an item of concern, usually buried somewhere near the bottom of the page, and it was described as something that all Satanists would have either in their possession or hidden somewhere safe. And it was a word that nearly everyone had to look up when they first encountered it. It was a peculiar item called a grimoire. From Cavalry Audio, I'm Brandon Morgan, and this is The Devil Within. You can run out for a long time, run for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, gonna cut you down. Sooner or later, gotta cut you down. This is episode seven, Acquainted with the Night. To begin, a grimoire is a book, though not the type of book you could check out of a library exactly, because they are usually unique to the bearer and, as a result, highly personal. A grimoire is created as a magical textbook to safely and secretly record instructions on the creation of talismans, how to perform various spells and charms, and specific incantations for the purpose of summoning demons or invoking other supernatural entities. The most famous of these tomes is entitled The Lesser Key of Solomon, an anonymously compiled spellbook that dates back to the 1650s. In the first of its five books, 72 demons are named and described, along with instructions on how to manifest them in the human plane of existence. The grimoire discovered in the bedroom of Tommy Sullivan was a crude, uninspired work, hastily put together with aggressive, disturbing sketches of monsters and clumsy narrative passages that depicted violence, fire, and suffering. It was unedited, raw and sophomoric, but it gave a stunning insight into the rapid degeneration of Tommy's that occurred in the weeks following his witnessing of the Black Mass. For his grimoire was once his composition notebook for his creative writing class at Reverend Brown Middle School. Within just a few pages, the topics change from a hero's exploits on the wrestling mat that win him the state championship and gets him a date with the cute cheerleader, to the ingredients for various spells, lists of terrible demons, and summoning rituals. But it also was a grim and melancholy diary of sorts. Often, in the final pages of the notebook, Tommy would show flashes of his former self, the nice Catholic boy who was eager to please and never got in trouble, the athlete concerned with where he might go to college, the adolescent who feared his awkwardness around girls. But there was also one disturbing passage just two days before the murder. Tommy had been having nightmares, and these he wrote about in alarming detail. He described a great demon who was coming to collect a debt that Tommy couldn't possibly pay, but he felt trapped, bound by some ancient, mysterious contract that he was powerless to deny. These fleeting passages of coherence and relative normalcy are punctuated by a few sentences from Tommy that sent members of the clergy into a state of barely controlled panic when they were made aware of it. Tommy claimed that in the days leading up to the murder, when he looked in the mirror, he no longer saw his young face reflected back. He saw the face of a demon. Let's return to the day following the Black Mass at the ruins of Cross Castle. It seems that Tommy woke up with a new purpose, a new curiosity, one that led him to change his usual route for his morning run. On this day, 
he ran the few miles to the public library and ensconced himself at a microfiche workstation in the basement and began to research the dark history of some of the area's most shadowy residents. And his primary target was Richard Cross. For those unaware, microfiche is a type of microform, which is simply miniature photographs, hundreds of them, transferred onto a single 8 by 10 inch negative. That negative is then laid onto an illuminated surface, and the tiny photographs are projected onto a screen at an individual terminal. A microfiche machine bears a strong resemblance to a desktop computer from the 90s, but with only a tiny fraction of the information contained within. But still, microfiche files are searchable to an extent, and much more efficient than leafing through page after page of decades-old newspapers. In the pre-internet era of 1987, it was considered state-of-the-art. It took hours before Tommy could even find a mention of the name Richard Cross in the archived newspaper clippings. He was a person of enormous wealth who built an extravagant castle in the woods, hosted fantastic parties, and died a mysterious death. What piqued Tommy's interest, though, was the mention of several crates full of books from the castle library that Cross's widow had donated. That information led Tommy on a new search, spanning more than 70 years of cryptic donation records, death certificates, clerical errors, administrative dead ends, and finally, to Violet Riker and her dream of a public library in Jefferson. When Tommy discovered that there was a chance that books from the library of the mysterious Richard Cross may still exist, finding them became his new obsession. To his amazement, he wouldn't have to wait long. On his third consecutive day scanning the stacks in the spacious main section of the new public library, a wash in the natural light pouring through the large panes of glass typical in the modern architectural movement of the 1980s, Tommy was approached by a staff member offering assistance. When he explained what he was looking for, Tommy was informed that many donated materials, especially large donations and crates, were still in storage, in the basement, right next to the microfiche room. The next day, Tommy had recruited Lance to accompany him to the basement of the library in hopes of finding the lost collection of Richard Cross. And this is where the beginnings of a conflict began to arise between the two new friends. Remember, Tommy was a serious skeptic. He was merely satisfying a youthful intellectual curiosity. Lance, however, was a recent convert, and his beliefs in Satanism and the occult were sincere. As a result... Lance was apprehensive about what they were doing, primarily because of how little respect Tommy was paying to the dangers that may be in store, if Cross were the kind of man described in the articles Tommy had read. What secrets may lie in his private collection of ancient books? What if he had an actual grimoire? No doubt Lance had to explain to Tommy exactly what a grimoire was and how to identify it, but that information didn't even begin to dissuade Tommy from his mission. While the mere thought of a bona fide spellbook filled Lance with a deep and abiding fear. Remember what Michael Kennedy witnessed on the night of the murder regarding the books set on fire in the Sullivan living room. After the house cleared, Bart McConley, the cop, lets a bunch of people into the house. Two friends of mine went back in and, yeah, there they were. Satanic books that were set up in a circle in the living room. It was like, what the hell's going on here? The police didn't have control of anything. They didn't know what the hell to do. Little unusual. According to one of those civilians who entered the Sullivan house on the night of the murder, this person declined to be interviewed, the book at the center of the circle, where the fire originated, was unlike any book they had ever seen. This person knows this because they left with the book and claim to still have it to this day. Although they refused to produce the book for investigative purposes, the description of it was very strange. A thick leather cover, which protected most of the pages from the fire, Several different types of paper, including many that didn't feel like paper at all. In all likelihood, they were describing vellum, a type of writing surface made from prepared calfskin, and it was bound by linen thread and melted wax. And the contents, as described, were equally strange and disquieting. Hardly any of it in English. Varying ink colors on almost every page, strange maps, lists of ingredients, gruesome sketches of terrible beasts and devils. It was a grimoire. But not Tommy's. His was in his bedroom. So whose was it? 
we can assume that a book like that was very valuable to its owner, or more specifically, its creator. And yet, Tommy tried to destroy it. Why? Before we can answer that, we need to know how we got the book in the first place. And that brings us back to the basement of the Jefferson Township Public Library on that day in late autumn of 1987. A few years ago, I was injured in a car accident that required a major surgery and a long, sedentary recovery. And what I found out was that at my age, when I stop exercising and stop being active, my eating habits catch up to me really quick. Bottom line is I put on weight that I didn't want for the first time in my life. And that led me to Noom, (laughs) primarily because there were a couple of foods that I didn't want to give up no matter what. And Noom will never tell you that any single food is off limits as long as it falls within a healthy, reasonable, balanced way of living. Noom only requires a daily commitment of 10 minutes, 10 minutes. And it's on their app, which is beautiful and simple to navigate. And while you're there, you learn about your eating habits and you get to check in on your progress. If you want a clearer understanding of your relationship with food and get rid of some bad habits that have been driving bad behavior, then Noom is the place for you. 80% of Noom users finish the program. Start building better habits for healthier, long-term results. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com within. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash within. Whether it's two guys in a garage who wanted to put a personal computer in every home in the world, or a guy who wanted to bring the bookstore to you rather than you having to go to the bookstore, passionately inspired entrepreneurs can change the world and have an impact on our daily lives. The couple that started Bull and Branch started it with a mission. They wanted to produce the highest quality sheets on the market and make the world a better place in the process. And if you want comfort that lasts, they are the best choice if you're in the market for a new set of sheets. I've had them for over a month now. And, you know, normally when we change the sheets out, we put them in the wash and we get a new set from the linen closet, make the bed. Uh, But not with these. We put them in the wash, we put them in the dryer, and we put them right back on the bed. My wife and I are in full agreement on that. No other sheets in our house exist. We sleep on our Bolin Branch signature sheet set, no matter what. They're light, they're soft, and somehow they're getting better every day. I'm so impressed by them. I've started buying them as gifts. Here's a sheet set. You're welcome. You can thank me later. And they always do. To experience the best sheets you've ever felt, choose Bowl and Branch. You can try them worry-free for 30 nights with free shipping and returns. And my listeners get an exclusive 15% off your first set of sheets with promo code WITHIN at bowlandbranch.com. That's bowlandbranch, B-O-L-L, and branch.com. Promo code WITHIN. Tommy, along with his reluctant sidekick, Lance, indeed discovered the crates of donated material from the widow of the late Richard Cross. Sitting in the basement in the cold, fluorescent lighting, they went through one man's lifetime of collected volumes. Books that defined who he was and who he once hoped to be and ultimately what he became. The collected history of a life spent in searching for questions without answers, for the deepest pleasures a man could know and the darkest depths that his spirit could reach. Strange books from all corners of Europe, scrolls from Greece and Egypt, dusty, decaying books with cracked leather covers and strange locking mechanisms. A collection that two 14-year-old boys simply didn't grasp the importance of because for whatever reason, no one else had for more than two generations. No one could be bothered to unpack the large crates. Instead, they had just been moved around from one location to the next, someone always assuming that the next guy would take care of it. Always the next guy. So there they sat, just waiting to be discovered. Many of the books were tossed aside because they were in a language the boys didn't understand. They only concentrated on the books in English or Latin, or if they looked really cool. Since they weren't dealing with normal library books that could be checked out, they each stashed a couple into their gym bags and left the library with the agreement that they would meet up at Tommy's house later in the evening and see what they really had. What they found would astonish them.
The legend of the Jersey Devil is generally accepted as a South Jersey phenomenon, most commonly associated with the sprawling and majestic Pine Barrens. And there's a reason for that. The books that Tommy and Lance discovered allowed them to take a peek behind the curtain of an ancient society and learn the secrets few have ever known. Many of the books contained lengthy and complicated recipes for spells, love potions, curses, zombie drafts that make the living appear dead, and all these called for extraordinarily rare ingredients and required months, if not years, to complete. They wondered, where am I going to find the skin of a virgin goat? Or how are we supposed to know when the next blood moon is so we can create the potion on the vernal equinox before that day? It all seemed impossible, almost as if the creators of these books didn't want anyone to actually do what the books claimed to allow. And they were right. It wasn't until Tommy started to leaf through a decidedly strange text, one with a crude leather cover and filled with pages made from a strange type of paper that things began to make sense. What was explained in this particular book was that there existed a certain moral responsibility among the truly devout paganists. Specifically, their spiritual curiosity should never endanger the innocent or uninitiated. No one should be able to just stumble upon a particularly dangerous spell, potion, or ritual. So a cloud of obfuscation was enacted to keep the more powerful and deadly of their secrets from anyone who didn't purposely seek them out. A perfect example of this is the legend of the Jersey Devil, and the subterfuge worked. No one thinks of North Jersey when they think of that particular creature. It's always the Pine Barrens. In actuality, we've all been the victims of a long con, a sleight of hand on a grand scale to keep the focus off a small patch of woods just outside of Jefferson in North Jersey. Richard Cross knew this. He knew of the strange properties possessed by that area. He had experienced similar geographic anomalies in Europe and knew what to look for. He knew to believe certain fantastic stories that other people would dismiss. He knew as soon as he set foot on that piece of land in the woods that he had found what he had sought for so long. He also knew to keep it a secret. However, he had a habit of writing everything down in his personal grimoire, including the Rule of Three. From Thanksgiving through mid-December, Tommy's time was split between his scholastic duties, his religious duties, his athletic duties, and now, additionally, he felt he needed to find time for his new hobby, creating his very own grimoire. Lance, for his part, was intent on pushing his friend away from the darker side of paganism and the occult, despite their both having witnessed the Black Mass. He was trying to convince Tommy that those people didn't really take that stuff seriously, it was just for show. Lance finally admitted that his interest didn't go beyond a genuine love of heavy metal music, the chance to seem cool to girls, and pissing off his parents. But Tommy seemed to grow more brazen every day in his newfound defiance, until finally, a simple question struck him like a thunderbolt. What if it's true? Paradoxically, Lance asked the same question. Only instead of the mischievous grin that Tommy wore when the question was posed, Lance's face showed pure fear. As Tommy dove deeper into the writings of Richard Cross, he made what almost proved to be a fatal mistake. Fatal to his plans, that is. There were a few passages in Latin from the grimoire that he was struggling with, and so he went to the only authority he trusted when it came to that long dead language, his priest. You can imagine the scene. Young Tommy, altar boy, familiar face around the church, comes knocking on the door of the rectory with a few questions. He has a piece of paper in his hand with passages he's transcribed. The good father is only too happy to help, for Latin is the language of the church, and this boy's natural curiosity must be encouraged. The first phrase needing translation was omne trium perfectum, or every set of three is complete. Easy enough, right? The priest goes on to explain that it refers to what we know as the rule of three, which is basically an observation of the human psyche that explains our attraction to things, all things, that come in three. Words, numbers, jokes. The rule of three appears everywhere in our lives. 
From literature, we get The Three Musketeers, The Three Little Pigs, The Ghosts of Christmas Past, Present, and Future, King Lear's Three Daughters, Mark Antony's Entreating of Friends, Romans, and Countrymen. Then there are the ubiquitous catchphrases such as Stop, Drop, and Roll, Veni, Vidi, Vici, Stop, Look, and Listen, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness. But somewhere during the priest's lesson on human psychology and the rule of three, he must have gotten worried. For soon after Tommy was dismissed from the rectory, his parents got a call from the church. Tommy was officially under observation, and it was suggested that all recent activity be investigated with special interest given to reading materials, musical interests, and new friends. What was it that spooked him so much? We can get closer to the answer when we examine a specific page from Tommy's grimoire, the page entitled The Rule of Three. Tommy apparently managed to get the translation he needed, and what he found seemed to be the antithesis of what someone would expect when it came to the business of ancient spells and summoning rituals. Nothing extravagant, nothing complicated. Everything was specific, clearly spelled out, and easy. There were words like locus, aura, and ritus, which beneath Tommy scrawled the English translation of these words, location, hour, ritual, followed by intentio, animo, and oblatio, intention, courage, offering. What Tommy was able to do was pierce the shroud of secrecy that clouded the truth regarding the most dangerous rites of the ancient pagans, going all the way back to the first inhabitants of North America. He discovered that the necessary ingredients weren't ingredients at all. What was actually required was the correct location at the correct time and knowledge of the correct ritual. He now had that information because on the pages that followed in Cross's grimoire, there was an architectural drawing of a structure that Tommy knew in a glance, the castle ruins where he witnessed the Black Mass. That was the location. Cross also wrote about the celebration of Yule, which began on the exact moment of the winter solstice. That was the time. And finally, a ritual was described that connected all the remaining dots. A simple ritual that even a boy of 14 could easily do. It involved encircling the sacred location three times. Intentio, animo, oblatio. The first circle announced your intention. The second circle proved your courage. And the third circle introduced your offering. On Tommy's next trip to the library, he had one book on his mind. The Farmer's Almanac. He needed to know when the winter solstice took place if he was going to achieve his ultimate goal. He learned that the approaching solstice was to be on the 22nd of December at exactly 10.45 p.m. According to his writings, this information gave Tommy only two short days to prepare and to convince Lance to go with him. Lance was growing increasingly apprehensive of Tommy and his cavalier attitude toward the mysterious powers of the occult. Understand, it was Tommy's intention to disprove the existence of any type of dark power, demonic possession, or any of the other fantastic assertions made by the true believers of paganistic practices. This was all an intellectual exercise for Tommy, a game. He saw it as a way to blow off some steam, to engage in a little teenage rebellion, and, in a truly exceptional way, to underscore his own faith in what he believed to be the true God, the God of Abraham. It worked out that Tuesday the 22nd was the last day of school before Christmas break, so it was easy for Tommy to arrange for his friend Lance to sleep at his house. There was some resistance from his parents, no doubt due to their priest's warnings about any new friends. But Lance was welcomed into the Sullivan home, as he always had been, and Mr. and Mrs. Sullivan fell asleep to the soothing, familiar sounds of their children laughing, talking, and watching television in the bedrooms down the hall. They would never have believed what their oldest son had planned for the evening. In 1987, you could dial from any landline in New Jersey, 844-1212, and hear a recording from the U.S. Naval Observatory that would give you the exact time down to the second. 
After Tommy had set his watch to the precise time, and he was sure his parents and little brother were asleep, he and Lance once again snuck out the back door to their waiting bicycles on the side of the house and began their 40-minute trek to the woods of Clinton Road, the darkness on the edge of town. It was colder this time, the air crisp with the first breaths of winter as the boys made their way through the night. There are three accounts of what transpired at the ruins of Cross Castle that night. The most accurate would be from Lance, but being a minor, we have no access to his testimony. So we must rely on questionable eyewitness accounts that on the surface don't make much sense. What we can piece together is that Tommy and Lance arrived at the ruins at approximately 10.30, leaving Tommy roughly 15 minutes to prepare for his Yule ritual. He lucked out in that the gathered Satanists that night, of which there were around 20, chose not to use the basement of the castle for their festivities, but a small clearing a short distance away. Tommy would have the castle to himself. We can imagine the conversation between Tommy and Lance. The casual suggestions to forget the whole thing coming from Lance, followed by Tommy's insistence that it was just a goof. There was no way anything crazy was going to happen. Then, upon their arrival in the dark forest, with the muffled sounds of the Satanists barely audible in the nearby woods, Lance's protests would begin in earnest. The whispered pleads blanketed by fear and confusion. And again, there's young Tommy, defiant and smiling in the pale light of a waxing moon. Tommy checks his watch, and as the minute arrives, begins his fateful trip around the sacred site. A walk around the ruins of Cross Castle only takes about 90 seconds in full light, so let's say that it would have taken Tommy around two minutes to navigate the uneven terrain in the dark. With the Satanists nearby, I doubt he would have used a flashlight. These two minutes must have been hell for Lance. When you're alone in the woods, your mind starts to do strange things, creating shadows where there are none, turning an innocent sound into a precursor to terror, a soft breeze into a howling wind. After what seemed like an eternity, Lance heard Tommy's footsteps nearing the south end of the castle and exhaled. Maybe now Tommy would call this whole thing off. No such luck. Tommy just shrugged and began his second trip around the castle. Now this is where we need to rely on some questionable accounts from purported eyewitnesses. The only two actual eyewitnesses were Tommy and Lance. Tommy is dead and Lance's statements are sealed despite several requests to various law enforcement agencies. So we're left with a handful of the worshippers in the nearby woods who have made some extraordinary claims. Like Tommy and Lance, they were aware of the exact time of the solstice and their accounts of the evening, of the disturbance as they call it happened between 10.45 and 10.50 p.m. It began with a sudden drop in temperature and a violent explosion of wind. One of the witnesses swore there was a tornado. All of their candles were suddenly extinguished. Sticks and leaves and all manner of debris were sent flying through the air, and it was followed by the cracking of thunder, followed by a brilliant white light that seemed to shoot up from the ground in the vicinity of the castle ruins. Yes, the blinding light came after the thunder. All accounts agree on this point. These descriptions of the events completely discount the police reports that state an explosion was caused by the misuse of objects and materials used in religious worship. The Satanists in the woods didn't cause the disturbance. They were terrified of it and ran for their lives. And it is here, finally, that we get the only credible account that places Tommy at Cross Castle that fateful night. If you recall in an earlier episode, the car full of people who saw two young men fleeing the scene and one seemed to be carrying the other. They decided to turn back and help the boys, but once they got back, the boys were gone. We can assume to a high degree of certainty that these two boys were Tommy and Lance. Was it Tommy who was struggling to walk? Probably. It's doubtful that Lance, nearly paralyzed with fear, would have ventured close enough to be harmed by whatever it was that happened during Tommy's encircling of the ruins. And what did happen? We'll never know for sure. It wasn't until months later that the event of December 22nd was even considered as germane to the murder of Betty Ann Sullivan and the suicide of Tommy. And by then, everybody just wanted it all to go away. Tommy Sr. and his surviving son had already sold the house and moved to Florida. Detective Hart was traveling the globe educating law enforcement agencies about the dangers of the occult and devil worship. And Jefferson Township was trying to get back to normal. 
Besides, the implications of where the evidence might lead were such that even the most seasoned investigators decided to take a pass. So we can assume that Tommy made his three trips around the secret site, that site being the ruins of Cross Castle. Omne trium perfectum. The rule of three had been invoked. Intentio, animo, oblatio. His intention was introduced. It was, in fact, nicely spelled out in the grimoire he found in the basement of the library, written by Cross himself. Tommy intended to summon a demon into the human plane of existence. He just wasn't sure how that was supposed to happen. But he continued on, thereby proving his courage, animo. But that courage, though sincere, was flawed and clouded by the innocence of his youth. Of all places or situations to be courageous, this wasn't it. But still, he completed the second circle despite the hell that erupted all around him. And as he began his third and final trip through the woods, Tommy, and Tommy alone, knows exactly what transpired. Did the sky open up? Did some kind of portal appear in the stone floor of the basement of the castle? What caused the crack of thunder and the flash of light? Whatever it was, caused Tommy to collapse and require the help of his friend to get him to safety. And we're left with Oblatio. What was the offering Tommy made that night, and to whom? Lastly, we're left to wonder. After reading Tommy's spell book and gleaning what he hoped to accomplish that night in the woods, if he was aware that he had gotten one of the Latin translations wrong, it was a simple, common mistake that has to do with context and the situational use of certain Latin nouns. But there's a chance that if Tommy had properly translated oblatio as it relates to the rule of three, he would have stayed home that night. Unfortunately, we can see, written in his own hand, offering as the English translation of oblatio, instead of, as it should have read, sacrifice. The next two weeks of Tommy's life would prove just how terrible and costly a mistake that would turn out to be. Coming up on the next episode of The Devil Within. It's a song often sung by poets, reminding us that it's later than we think and imploring us to seize the day. However, Frost, in his unflinching honesty and wisdom, boldly tells us that as sure as the dawn will yield to the coming day, and ultimately the dark of night. As sure as that first green of spring will be forgotten in the creeping death of autumn, so too is our own time in the sun but a moment in the march of history. It is with this understanding that we must accept that the bright and fleeting dawn that was the life of Tommy Sullivan had begun its descent into darkness. Go tell that long tongue preacher The Devil Within is a Cavalry Audio production, written and directed by Brandon Morgan. Original score by Monkey Mind Music Group. Original music by Bruce Whitkin. Executive produced by Keegan Rosenberger and Dana Brunetti. For Cavalry Audio, I'm Brandon Morgan. <laughs>